Hello, welcome to Good Night Flagstaff. I'm Tom Verstreet. My wife and I read for my granddaughter's first grade class, and we enjoyed it so much we wanted to start reading for Good Night Flagstaff. Thank you for tuning in to our community story time. You can find a new chapter from one of our favorite family friendly books at 8 p.m. each weeknight on the Literacy Center's YouTube channel, on Crater Radio, and an online local radio station. The previous chapter is replayed on Crater Radio each weeknight at about 7.45, just before the new chapter airs. You can also listen to all previous Good Night Flagstaff recordings on YouTube. We are currently reading from the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, Book 5, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. If you'd like to check out any of the Narnia books to read along with us at home, they're all available on the Hoopla app with your Coconino County library card. Check one out today. Please email us if you'd like to join our team of readers and connect with your community through the stories. All ages welcome. Our email is goodnightflagstaff at gmail.com. Last time we read together, Lucy and the Magician talked about the Duffers who are concealed and lacking common sense. The dwarven mushroom-footed Duffers cheered Lucy for making them visible but wouldn't accept Lucy's compliments, not until Reepicheep taught them to surf did they start to feel better about themselves. Changing their names to the Duffelpuds then the magician helped fix the Dawn Treader, made a map where they could, where they had been, and loaded them with gifts for the next leg of the journey. Chapter 12 The Dark Island After this adventure, they sailed on south, a little east for twelve days with a gentle wind, the skies being mostly clear, the air warm, and saw no bird or fish except that once there were whales spouting along the way on the starboard. Lucy and Reepicheep played a good deal of chess at this time. Then on the thirteenth day, Edmund, from the fighting top, sighted what looked like a great dark mountain rising out of the sea on their port bow. They altered course and made for this land, mostly by oar, for the wind would not serve them to sail northeast. When evening fell, they were still a long way from it and rowed all night. The next morning, the weather was fair, but a flat calm prevailed. The dark mass lay ahead, much nearer and larger, but still very dim, so that some thought it was still a long way off, and others thought they were running into a mist. About nine that morning, very suddenly, it was so close that they could see that it was not land at all, nor even an ordinary, in an ordinary sense a mist. It was a darkness. It is rather hard to describe, but you will see what it was like if you imagine yourself looking into the mouth of a railway tunnel, a tunnel either so long or so twisty you could not see the light at the far end. And you know what it would be like? For a few feet, you would see the rails and the sleepers and the gravel in the broad daylight. And then there would come a place where they, they were in twilight. And then, pretty suddenly, but out of course without a sharp dividing line, they would vanish altogether into smooth, solid blackness. It was just so here. For a few feet in front of their prows, they could see the swell of the, blue, greenish blue, of the bright greenish-blue water. Beyond that, they could see the water looking pale and gray as it would look in late evening. But beyond that again, utter blackness, as if they had come to the edge of the moonless and starless night. Caspian shouted to the boatswain to keep her back, and all except the rowers rushed forward and gazed from the bows. But there was nothing to be seen by gazing. Behind them the sea and the sun, before them the darkness. Do we go into this? asked Caspian at length. Not by my advice, said Drinian. The captain's right, said several sailors. And I almost think he is, said Edmund. Lucy, 
and Ustace didn't speak, but they felt very glad inside at the turn things seemed to be taking. But all at once, the clear voice of Ribichi broke in upon the silence. And why not? he said. Will someone explain to me why not? No one was anxious to explain, so Ripachip continued. If I were addressing the peasants or slaves, he said, I might suppose that this suggestion proceeded from cowardice. But I hope it will never be told in Narnia that the company of noble and royal persons in the flower of their age turned tail because they were afraid of the dark. But what manner of use would it be plowing through that blackness? asked Drinian. Use? asked Repetit. Use, Captain? If by use you mean filling our bellies and our purses, I will confess it was no use at all. So as far as we did not set sail to look for things useful, but to seek honor and adventure. And here it is, a great adventure as ever, I heard of, and here, if we turn back, no little impeachment of all our honors. Several of the sailors said things under their breath that sounded like honor be blowed. But Caspian said, Oh, bother you, Repicheep. I almost wish we'd left you at home. All right, if you put it that way, I suppose we shall have to go on, unless Lucy would rather not. Lucy felt that she, that she would very much rather not. But what she said aloud was, I'm game. Your Majesty will at least order lights, said Drinian. By all means, said Caspian. See to it, Captain. So three lanterns at the stern and the prow and the masthead were all lit, and Drinian ordered two torches amidships. Pale and feeble they looked like in the sunshine. Then all the men accepted, except some of those who were left below at the oars were ordered on deck. Their and fully armed and posted in their battle stations, with swords drawn. Lucy and two archers were posted on the fighting top, with bows, bows bent and the arrows on the string. Rynelf was at the bows, bows, with his line ready to take soundings. Ripicheep, Edmund, Estes, and Caspian, glittering in mail, were with him. Drinian took, a, took the tiller. And now, in Aslan's name, forward, cried Caspian, a slow, steady stroke, and let every man be silent and keep his ears open for orders. With a creak and a groan, the dawn treader started to creep forward as men began to row. Lucy, up in the fighting top, had a wonderful view of the exact moment in which they had entered the darkness. The bows had already disappeared, before the sunlight had left the stern. She saw it go. At one minute, the gilded stern, the blue sea, and the sky were all in broad daylight. The next minute, the sea and the sky had vanished. The stern lantern, which had been hardly noticeable before, was the only thing in show where the ship ended. In front of the lantern, she could see the black shape of the of Drinian crouching at the tiller. Down below her, the two torches made visible two small patches of deck and gleamed on swords and helmets. And forward, there was another island of light on the forecastle. Apart from that, the fighting top, lit by the masthead light, which was only just above her, seemed to be a little lighted world as if it was floating in a lonely darkness. And the lights themselves, as always happens with lights when you have them at the wrong time of day, looked lured and unnatural. She also noticed that she was very cold. How long this voyage into the darkness lasted, nobody knew, except for the creak of the oar rowlocks and the splash of the oars, there was nothing to show that they were moving at all. Edmund peered from the bows. He could see nothing except the reflection of the lantern in the water before him. It looked like a greasy sort of reflection, and the ripple made by their advancing prow appeared to be heavy, small, and lifeless. 
As time went on, everyone except the, ro- except the rowers began to shiver with cold. Suddenly, from somewhere, no one's sense of direction was very clear by now, there came a cry, either of some inhuman voice or else a voice of one in such extremity of terror that he had almost lost his humanity. Caspian was still trying to speak, his mouth was too dry, when the shrill voice of Reepicheep sounded louder than usual and that silence was heard. Who calls it, piped? If you are a foe, we do not fear you. And if you are a friend, your enemies shall be taught to fear us. Mercy, cried the voice. Mercy, even if you are only more a dream, have mercy. Take me on board. Take me, even if you strike me dead. But in the name of all mercies, do not fade away and do not leave me in this horrible land. Where are you? shouted Caspian. Come aboard and welcome. There came another cry, whether of joy or terror, and then they knew that someone was swimming toward them. Stand by to heave him up, men, said Caspian. Aye, aye, your majesty, said the sailors. Several crowded to the port with ropes, and one leaning far out over the side held a torch. A wild white face appeared in the blackness of the water, and then, after some scrambling and pulling, a dozen friendly hands had heaved the stranger on board. Edmund thought he had never seen a wilder-looking man. Though he did not otherwise look very old, his hair was an untidy mop of white, his face was thin and drawn, and for clothing only a few wet rags hung about him. But one mainly noticed was her his eyes, which were so widely open that he seemed to have no eyelids at all, and stared as if in agony of pure fear. The moment his feet reached the deck, he said, Fly, fly, about with your ship, fly, row, 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 for your lives, away from this accursed shore. Compose yourself, said Repicheep, and tell us what the danger is. We are not used to flying. The stranger stared horribly at the voice of the mouse which he had not noticed before. Nevertheless, you will fly from here, he gasped. This is the island where dreams come true. That's the island I've been looking for this long time, said one of the sailors. I reckon I'd find it. I was married to Nancy if we landed here. And I'd find Tom alive again, said another. Fool, said the man, stamping his foot with rage. That is the sort of talk that brought me here, and I'd rather have been drowned or never born. Do you hear what I say? This is where dreams, dreams do you understand, come to life, come real, not daydreams, dreams. There was about a half a minute silent, and then, with great clatter of armor, the whole crew went tumbling down the main hatch as quick as they could, flinging themselves on the oars to row as they had never rowed before. Andrinian was swinging around the tiller, and the boatswain was giving out the quickest stroke that had ever been heard at sea, for it had taken everyone just that half a minute to remember certain dreams they had had, dreams that make you afraid of going to sleep again, and to realize that it would mean what it means to land in a country where dreams come true. Only Reepicheep remained unmoved. Your Majesty, Your Majesty, he said, are you going to tolerate this mutiny? This poltroonery? This is panic. This is a rout. Row, row, bellowed Caspian. Pull for all your lives. Is her head right, Drinian? You can say what you like, Ripicheep. There are some things no man can face. It is then my good fortune not to be a man, replied Ripicheep with a very stiff bow. Lucy, from up aloft, had heard it all. In an instant that one of her own dreams, which she had tried hardest to forget, came back to her as vividly as if she had only woken from it. So that was what was behind them, on the island, in the darkness. For a second, she wanted to go down to the deck and be with Edmund and Caspian. But what was the use? If dreams began coming true, Edmund and Caspian themselves might turn into something horrible just as he had reached them. She gripped the rail of the fighting top and tried to steady herself. They were rowing back into the light as hard as they could. 
it would be all right within a few seconds. But oh, if only it could be all right now. Though the rowing made it a good deal of noise, it did not quite conceal the total silence which surrounded the ship. Everyone knew it would be better not to listen to the strained ears for any sound of the coming darkness. And soon everyone was hearing things. Each one heard something different. Do you hear the noise? Like a huge pair of scissors opening and shutting over here? Your stage asked Rynelf. Hush, said Rynelf. I can hear them crawling up the sides of the ship. It's going to settle on the mast, said Caspian. Ugh, said a sailor. There are gongs beginning. I knew they would. Caspian, trying not to look at anything, especially not to keep looking behind him, went aft to Drinian. Drinian, he said in a very low voice, how long did we take rowing in? I mean, rowing to where we picked up the stranger. Five minutes, perhaps, whispered Drinian. Why? Because we've been more than that already, trying to get out. Drinian's hand shook on the tiller, and a line of cold sweat ran down his face. The same idea was occurring to everyone on board. We shall never get out. Never get out, moaned the rowers. He's steering us wrong. We're going around and round in circles. We shall never get out. The stranger, who had been lying in a huddled heap on the deck, sat up and burst out into a horrible screaming laugh. Never get out, he yelled. That's it, of course. We shall never get out. What a fool I was to have thought I would be let go as easily as that. No, 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 we shall never get out. Lucy leant her head on the edge of the fighting top and whispered, Aslan, Aslan, if you ever loved us at all, send us help now. The darkness did not grow any less, but she began to feel a little, a very little better. After all, nothing has really happened to us yet, she thought. Look, cried Reinleff's voice hoarsely from the bows. There was a tiny speck of light ahead, and while they watched, a broad beam of light fell from it onto the ship. It was it did not alter the surrounding darkness, but the whole ship was lit up as if by a searchlight. Caspian blinked, stared around, saw the faces of the, his companions, all with wild, fixed expressions. Everyone was staring in the same direction. Behind everyone lay his black, sharply edged shadow. Lucy looked along the beam and presently saw something in it. At first it looked like a cross. Then it looked like an aeroplane. Then it looked like a kite, and at last, a, with a whirring of wings, it was right overhead, and it was an albatross. It circled three times around the mast and then perched for an instant on the crest of the golden dragon at the prow. It called a strong, sweet voice that seemed to be the words, though no one understood them. After that, it spread its wings, rose, and began to fly slowly ahead bearing a little to starboard. Drinian steered after it, not doubting that it offered a good guidance. But no one except Lucy knew that as it circled the mast, it had whispered to her, Courage, dear heart. And the voice she felt sure was Aslan's. And with that, the voice, a delicious smell breathed into her face. In a few moments, the darkness turned into grayness ahead, and then almost before they dared to begin hoping, they had shot out into the sunlight and were in the warm blue world again. And all at once, everyone realized that there was nothing to be afraid of and never had been. They blinked their eyes and looked about them. The brightness of the ship herself astonished them. They had half expected to find the darkness would cling to the white and the green and the gold in the form of some grime or scum. And then first one, then another began laughing. I reckon we've made ourselves pretty good, fool, pretty good fools of ourselves, said Ryanelf. Lucy lost no time in coming down to the deck where she found the others all gathered around the newcomer. For a long time he was too happy to speak and then could only gaze at the sea and the sun. 
and feel the bulk warts and the ropes as if to make sure he was really awake and the tears rolled down his cheeks. Thank you, he said at last. You have saved me from, but I won't talk of that. And now let me know who you are. I am Telmarine of Narnia. And when I was worth anything, men called me Lord Roop. And I, said Caspian, am Caspian, king of Narnia, and sailed to find you and your companions, who were my father's friends. Lord Roop fell on his knees and kissed the king's hand. Sire, he said, you are the man in all the world I most wish to see. Grant me a boon. What is it? asked Caspian. Never to bring me back there, he said, and pointed to Stern. They all looked, but they saw only bright blue sea and bright blue sky. The dark island and the darkness had vanished forever. Why, cried Lord Roop, you have destroyed it. I don't think it was us, said Lucy. Sire, said Drinian, this wind is fair for the southeast. Shall I have our poor fellows set up a sail? And after that, every man who can be spared to his hammock? Yes, said Caspian. And let there be grog all around. Hi ho! I feel I could sleep the clock around myself. So all afternoon, with great joy, they sailed southeast with a fair wind, and no one noticed when the albatross had disappeared. Thank you for tuning in. Join us next time for Chapter 13 The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Good night, Flagstaff. <laughs>